also, she's sitting at the little table pretending to be an old lady. Also a ninja. And then magically. She's a winja. <laughs> <laughs> That was a long hey. It was. It's Midsummer Maniacs, as if you didn't know. Mid- I'm Sarah. I'm Mark, and Midsummer Maniacs is a recap podcast dedicated to the ITV series Midsummer Murders. Each week we dig into an episode that shows you the murders, the mayhem, the loonies, and everything else we love. Including all of the weird stuff in the background that nobody but crazy people would notice. Now, we got really good at that. We got to go over the warning for this episode because if this episode was too much for your kids with all the naked bits, the podcast might be okay because we won't have any naked bits. You can't do naked bits in audio. No. It might no, be all right. No. Though we have no <laughs> But they won't be able to follow along cuz they won't have seen yes. the episode with the nudie bits. Did you know the nudie bits got cut out during the daytime programming of this uh, episode? I'm not surprised by that at all. Yeah. They cut the painting and the lady? Uh, they cut the lady for sure. I don't know about the painting. Well, if you're not sure what we're talking about, we're talking about episode two of season 12, which is the black book. That's why we're talking about number 68. Yes, our episode number 68. But off the top, we've got a few things to tell you about before we dive into the black book. First of all, on Tuesday. So that is... Tuesday. That that tomorrow, will, if you're listening to this on the day that it drops, yes, on Tuesday, December 15th, we're dropping this year's musical parody Midsummer. Yeah, it's our present to you. It's going to be available on YouTube, Facebook video on the Midsummer Murders group, and on Instagram video on our Instagram account. You're going to drop it everywhere, aren't yep. you? Yep. And we might put out just a little bit, a little one minute episode just to remind you. Just to remind if you. If you forgot about the awesomeness that is our seasonal parody song. Yes. Some uh-huh. of you have been sending some lyrics in for your own ideas. Keep sending them. They're fun. We have taken it to a new level. I think we have. I think we've outdone the 12 days of Midsummer from last oh, year. Oh, way outdone 12 <laughs> days of Midsummer. I will warn you, though, it does include me singing. Yes. <laughs> for better or for worse. <laughs> Actual singing. (laughs) Actual singing. (laughs) Speaking of people who are awesome, we got a tweet this week that's just amazing. It made my day because you shared this tweet with me on a day when I had met one-on-one for 20 minutes each via Zoom with 11 of my students who are wonderful and they're working on great projects and it's really beneficial to them. But I was about to lose my mind. And then you sent me that tweet and it made me happy again. This is a tweet from Ingrid Dory, Clara Eliza Jemima. That's one person. I'm guessing it's not one person. It's an account that represents a whole lot of awesomeness. Well, they say, I'm listening to episode 56, Death and Dust. And I'm listening alone, and I'm crying with laughter at Sarah's mishearing of the boys. <laughs> Real tears of laughter are streaming down my face. That's the one where George's wife tells Jones to, like, go go get people. And I, I thought she said, like, go get the Crombies or something. Yeah. I don't know what I thought she said. And, and I had done all this research trying to figure out who those people were. Like, what is that reference? What is that a reference to? I don't get it. And it turns out she just said the boys. I'm like, uh, she says the boys. I'm still sticking by the fact that she said something different. I'm, I'm still. You could clearly hear it in the audio that she says the boys. I don't think you hear it so well. The subtitles say inaudible, if I remember right. But if you look at her lips, she does say the boys. I'll concede that after 10 episodes later, I will concede at least her lips say the boys. So keep those cards and letters coming, coming, (laughs) coming. Keep those cards and letters. Gift for Burning uh, mentioned us on a New York Magazine tweet as one of the best podcasts of the year. That's so nice. Just so wonderful. And in amongst some other really awesome podcasts in that list, and we were on it, and that makes me feel good. Like, we're just... These guys in Indiana doing this crazy thing. When we decided to do this podcast, we didn't do it thinking, let's do a podcast where the audience would be really nice people who would be really wonderful. But we managed to find 
an audience that is just great. We started our first month. We had a thousand downloads, and I was like, "I am the most popular human being." On the <laughs> Clearly, I have this podcasting thing figured it out. It exceeded our expectations right away that anybody would want to listen. And as of today, we are very. Oh yeah, we're way over fifty thousand downloads. Yes, by now. and with twenty five thousand views on youtube we're getting we're eyeing a hundred thousand now hey now so that's awesome yeah that's insane Ugh, it's just fun it's so fun and we need fun in our lives right now when the world is is maybe looking up a little bit but isn't always fun on the day-to-day details Whew. but speaking of fun sucking we're not going to be here for two weeks <laughs> <laughs> we are going to take two weeks off yes uh to uh Celebrate the holidays with our massive number of massive children. Yes. So this episode our drops. Four 19 year olds. <laughs> this episode drops on the 14th of December. December. And we will be returning on the 4th of January, which the best part of writing that down was we are returning on the 4th of January, 2021. Which means 2020 will be over. Will be over. Yeah. Yeah. With oh. episode 69, Secrets and Lies, which is an amazingly crazy, weird, fun episode. Yeah. But, you know, the one that we've got for this week is amazingly crazy and fun, yep. too. Yep. So so just taking a two-week break, you get the the midsummer, the new Midsummer parody uh, holiday music extravaganza on Tuesday the 15th. <laughs> I might be building this up a little too much now. <laughs> and hopefully that will hold you over until the 4th of January. I'm telling you, it's 30 seconds, man. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the best it's, 30 seconds. It's quick, but it's awesome. Yeah, it's so, awesome. So this episode filmed July, August 2008, broadcast the 5th of August 2009, 6.28 million views, directed by Peter Smith and written by Nicholas Martin. I'm going to tell you right off the top, I've got four amazingly horrible movies to wrap us up today. Excellent. So when we're done talking about the episode, I'm going to lay him down. Okay. And I'm going to get four out of four. Oh, that's trash talking. Dropping the gauntlet. Yep. Oh, boy. This episode has got crazy art society ladies, pigs. Auctions. Auctions. Insurance investigators, Peaky Blinders, you name it. We got it. So it starts with an old lady going down the street like so many other episodes. Hmm. And I she, sense a theme in Midsummer of old ladies pushing or riding wheeled conveyances. She has a painting. Yes. And she goes into Anthony Prideaux's place. Now, before we talk about Anthony, I want to talk about his name because I saw that name. It's obviously a French name. P-R-I-D-E-A-U-X. Yeah. That's got French name written all over it. So I looked it up to see if it was a French word for pride or arrogance or dude who gets killed in the second act (laughs) with a mysterious appearing door. Did you notice that? (laughs) No, it's just a name. It's a made up. But but like Sirius Black, it feels like... It sounds like it should be like prideful or full of pride or arrogant or something. Because he is all of those things. He even insults Barnaby's intelligence. And he is... Strangely bigger, strange. <laughs> David Bamber. He's David Bamber. Who's a great actor who we call bigger, strangely strong. Yes. Because Though he's this, not strangely strong in this episode. We can't tell he's got a suit on most of the time. Uh, but shortly after this episode, for some reason, David Bamber decides to start pumping some iron. Which is fantastic. It's awesome. Yep. But he bulks up. Oh boy, does he bulk up. Yeah. So we, around our house, he's bigger, strangely strong. Who is We, we love, love you, him. David. We love him. You're a great actor. We talked about him a million times. And this is his second of three Midsummer episodes that he's been in. Yes, so he was in Dead Letters. Yes. Then he's in this, The Black Book. And then he is in A Dying Art later, which he is strong in. He's strong, he's strong in by that then. One. Okay. <laughs> so somewhere in that seven year gap, he gets both. Nice. Well, I, I love this scene. This is one of my favorite cold opens because so the idea is this lady who brings the felicity law the, the little doddering old lady who, who wants to sell the painting and maybe get birdbath she's got her. it wrapped in newspaper yep. and she's kind of mistreating it a little bit and so he's like i won't I, I won't even look at it it's not the kind of thing i would sell and then he sees it and he's like oh yeah so, <laughs> his so eyes that's, go, that's the, the top level is he lies to her and says oh you know 
He chases her down the street and yep. grab, physically grabs her and says, I'll give you a thousand pounds. I don't yes. care, whatever. So he does a great job of appearing to lie to her, but actually not. Obviously <laughs> lying, but appearing to try not to look like yes. he's lying. Which is great. <laughs> so then there's the level of this scene where she at the end basically calls him out. And she, she is knows also lying. That she, well, that's she the third level. She knows what she's got. The th- she knows she has something of value. But the third level is, is the, her and the lady from the Sims art school, what's her Matilda. name? Matilda. Her and Matilda have actually staged this whole event. Oh, yes. So they are staging it to create interest in the painting. They're just splashing the bait on the top of the water and then pulling it back out yeah. again. Just to get the fishies interested. And this is all in this one scene. Mm-hmm. And it, it's because Anthony, uh, because the two actors are really good. Yeah. Like they're, they're spectacular in this scene. Yeah. And Felicity Law in the rest of the episode, well, until she dies a few minutes later, is not nearly as doddering as she pretends to be in this one scene. Not only is she leading him down the garden path, knowing what she's got, knowing it's also a fake, but... She's also pretending to be far more feeble and silly than she is. Oh, she knows she's exactly what she's doing. well aware of yeah. the art world. And I love and that. the she... painting is by Dodge, Dogson. Hogson. Hogson. There's enough pigs in this episode. You'd think you'd remember that it's Hogson. Yes, it's Hogson, who is not a real person. No, no. Hodgson is a real person. Mm-hmm. There was an, somebody else who kept coming up in the searches when you do Hog, <laughs> Hogson. And no, no, no. Hodgson's she, not a real person. She rips the newspaper off of it to show it to him and just leaves the newspaper on his floor. <laughs> just leaves <laughs> it on out. his floor. I'm out of here. I wonder what the art gallery will have to say about mm-hmm. it. So the painting is Bishop's Drift. Yes. Right? And it is a painting of the Bishop John Fletcher fly fishing Which, on the river there in Midsummer. Yes. By Henry Hogson. And this is an unknown painting by the great Henry Hogson. Yes. Who right. is a landscape painter of the late 18th century who lived and worked in Midsummer. So Hogson is supposed to remind us of like a Turner or a Gainsborough, somebody who painted the British pastoral yep. with a little bit of social commentary in there, which is why... And some fecund. He gets compared to um, like Wordsworth and Hausman and George Crabby because they all had that, you know, social commentary going on in their art and their work. But Graham Spade is here now and he's walking past the Lockfin seafood bar that we've seen in another episode yeah they're consistent with that town square for costume yeah, yeah. yeah. and an oxman books and a nicholas's which is selling champagne i don't know if you noticed that but they had big crates of it and a big sign in the window now if you're like me as soon as you saw graham spate and his red hair and lanky body you went oh my god it's arthur shelby from peaky blinders peaky Bli- okay as a child if we have not told you <laughs> about peaky blinders stop and go watch Peaky Blinders. Who Blinders. hasn't heard of Peaky Blinders? It's if you've not so seen it, but you've heard of it, then you you should know that he is like, I don't know, the second starring role. Yeah. He's more than a supporting role. And he plays a young man who is... He's shell-shocked. Yep. He has PTSD from the war, but he's a member of his family's gang. He's the enforcer, really, of the gang. Yeah, because he is prone to losing it. Yeah, he's and, a berserker. And going... <laughs> Ultra violent because yeah. you know he's got PTSD, but he he's a great actor. His name is um, Paul Anderson, and he's so good. He's in this other movie called The Firm that's about soccer hooligans who organize into like clubs, and he has this wicked bull haircut that is so horrible, like literal bull inverted on your head, cut it all the way around. He is a brave man with his hair. He's like cut it however you need it to be. He's cut. got great hair. Yeah. But man, not in that movie. Whoa, it's bad. It's so bad. So he is, Graham Spate is a former convict, right? Out of jail, having been charged with numerous thefts. Who is also a very good artist. Who has gone to the Sims Art School and Reform Center. Yes. And done some painting and was good at it, but didn't turn his life around because he says crime is more creative than art. Yes. But he wants, to, he wants to get into the auction house because they're showing off this Hogson that's never been seen before, before it's sold. Now, he didn't paint this Hogson. No, but he knows it's fake. He knows it's fake. So the 
The auction, did you notice, was on Tuesday, the 22nd of July. No, I didn't notice that. Who has auctions on Tuesday in the afternoon? Uh, I don't know. Specialty auctions are often held at times like that because if you're really into it, you're going to be there. I guess. They have to do more general auctions when more people can come, right? But Prudhoe is there and, and almost acting as if it's his painting, like he's the agent in charge of the painting or whatever he's showing yes. it off and yes and in the crowd there admiring the painting before the auction is a man who's credited as the admirer yep his name is neville phillips the actor's name is neville phillips. you guys should know him because he's been in a million midsummer this is his sixth midsummer it's the last episode that he's in he was in faithful into death garden of death dark autumn birds of prey vixens run and now the black book wow He's a professional extra. He's he only been, gets a name in one episode. He's been in a bunch of movies, too. He's been vicars and vicars and priests and admirers and some guy named Rich. <laughs> Rich! <laughs> but yeah, he is, he is a well-established extra. We forgot to mention something about Graham, though. Mm-hmm. He is a one-man red herring. He is. His whole role in the entire episode is to mislead us. Yes. And then get killed viciously. Incredibly viciously. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let's introduce who else is at the auction. Then we'll talk about the brutality of human beings. Right. Because we get the whole cast of characters here, right? So we've already got Predo. We've got Felicity Law. We've got Graham Spate. Then we get Matilda Sims, who runs the art center. And we get Alan Best, the king of frozen food. Yes. Who's supposed to be like, you know, a street guy come good because he's made money. He's an entrepreneur. Yep. And he collects Hogsons. And then... His wife never gets a name, by the way. No, she's just his wife. Yep. She gets lines, but no name. Her name is Yvonne. Oh, that's right. But it doesn't matter. Yeah. Then comes the scene-eating Arlington. George Arlington. Yes. Played by Gavin O'Hurley. Do you mean... Colonel Sanders. He looks a little bit like Gary Busey. Gary of. Busey playing Colonel Sanders. Yes, yes. But he is Irish, but he plays so many American roles. He was in Jonathan Creek. It was an episode called Dance Macabre. Yep. And he's the like bodyguard. It's one and of he's, our favorite episodes. And he's American yes, in that he's episode American too. American in that episode. But he's got a string tie on and a cowboy hat. So he is Colonel Sanders in this episode. Yep. And he is from Texas. And he has come to buy another Hogson for his collection. Hogson. And he plays half a million pounds for it. Yep. And which he- makes Patricia Blackshaw Nutsy Bobo. Okay. She loses her mind. Okay. Patricia Blackshaw had lost her mind long before this. That's true. That's true. Okay. She is Looney McToonie. She was Looney the day she decided that her painting was good enough to go on a wall where other people would see it. Because wow, is it bad. And I love how Tom just editorializes yeah. Like, it. she didn't paint the forgery because I've seen her work and mm, no. It's not really it, work. N- no, she couldn't <laughs> have done it. No, she's off the hook for that. She is the president of the Hogson Society. But we know another member of the Hogson Society. Of course, Joyce is a member because Joyce is a member of everything. Okay, why is Barnaby here? To support Joyce, because she's been working really hard raising money for the Hogson Society. I understand. So he's being her cheerleader. But he has a job. I know. And he's taken a little bit of time off during the day to support his wife, because she's clearly worked very hard. She's raised 120,000 pounds. Which is a huge amount of money. Which is like, yeah, like squeezing blood out of a stone in a place like Coston. It's not a big place. But I'll tell you what, Joyce is great at raising money, but... I'm telling you, I'm not taking her to an auction. No, <laughs> no, because she just is like, um, you don't have enough to buy that. <laughs> she's plus, right, though. But she's right. But she has no poker face either. Oh, gosh, no. When they reach their <laughs> when they reach their limit, she's, she's like, like whoa, oh, whoa, no. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, okay. no. Like, um, An auction is all about not showing how much money you can it's, spend. N- it's showing not how eager you are to have the thing, not how much money you're willing to bid. You're supposed to be nonchalant and uncommitted the whole time. Yes. and like, But but Patricia's not good at that either. No, Patricia's not I good at that. I have to have it. If I have to live in a pig's die, I need to have it. And her husband, her poor husband. When Colonel Sanders shows up, is the right time to show up when you want to buy something. Yeah. When you know you have more money than anybody else in the room, yep. you show up just as they're about to sell it. You just wait till the you end. you double the bet. 
double. You the, don't even have to do that. Bill. You just go a dollar more, and yep. then they go sold, and Colonel Sanders gets it. Mm, it's finger licking good dogs. <laughs> it's finger licking good hogs. <laughs> Have you bought stuff at auction before? Have you bid at an auction? Oh, so the auction history I have is I've bought stuff at auctions, but we used to go as a social thing to auctions on a weekly basis because my father would buy junk and then resell it Yeah. to other people. Yeah. But I also, I remember as a kid going to livestock auctions, which are much faster. Oh, it's completely different. <laughs> and you, you literally have to stay absolutely still. Yeah, because any twitch could be a bid, right? And I remember as a kid seeing, going enough times that I could see that people were bidding and getting the feel of it. And it's a real kind of secret grouping, society kind of thing. Yeah, but unlike at a regular auction, when you're not supposed to get too close to the merchandise in advance to check it out, you can look at it, but, you know, not like juggle it around or whatever. Before a uh, a live stock auction... People are fondling the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, let me touch that bowl and feel this and feel that and know that I'm going to bid on it. Oh, totally. <laughs> totally. I've never accidentally bid for something, but I have been accused of it. Oh, like I can remember the smell of the livestock. Oh, I bet. And the room. Yeah. Like I can, that conjures up memories in my head. Definitely. My grandpa was not an auctioneer. He was the auctioneer's assistant. Oh, okay. So he would hold the stuff up. My dad at a place sometime, called the Sale Barn. That's no, what we called it. The Sale Barn. That's where I went to livestock auctions. Yeah. It was the Sale Barn. My dad would sometimes help with moving cows in and out and stuff like that. Yeah, but this is a fancy art auction Ooh, where you just put two fingers up and yes or nod. Yes, you know I've been to auctions where you had to go, "Hey, I want to bid on that," or they would never have noticed you. <laughs> Patricia is so mad. Oh, my gosh. And her, her husband is like, we don't have that money. She's like, I don't care. I have to have it. And that, then Felicity Law, who is the now the most sophisticated woman in the room. Oh, yes. Is like, well, I've had a very good life. So I'm going to go on a little trip and buy my bird bath. Mm-hmm. I guess the bird bath is implied because she gets <laughs> half a million pounds. Yeah. She's going to keep two grand for herself to go on a little holiday and give the rest to the Sims Art Center. Matilda is super happy. As she should be, because uh, Patricia's husband, as part of the city council, just uh, count the village council or whatever, county council, just rejected her funding application. So the Sims Art School is out of money. Yeah, well, we see the effects of them being out of money later on. There's so much to say about that place. <laughs> they can't even afford clothes. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Patricia stomps out, leaving her husband behind. She, he is the poor man of the episode. Oh, yeah. Like, he does stuff for her. He's trying. He's trying. And she just is like, I'm taking a plane to Florence with two million pounds. Goodbye. She's a little bundle of angry. Yes. But I know you're mad, but there's no excuse for littering. <laughs> she throws the auction brochure on the ground. That makes you mad. I'm like, oh. I don't care if you kill people. I don't care if you beat beat a peaky blinder to death on his own kitchen table, but do not litter. That is just right out. Right out. Unacceptable. (laughs) Then George and Anthony have this weird kind of, I'll see you at your hotel room. And it's like, we know what happens. Yeah. And we know what this is about. But I was like, the first time watching this, you might be like, are they uh, having a rendezvous? Oh, I never thought that. Okay. I thought that uh, George Arlington um, is a businessman and is wheeling and dealing. Well, and was going to take Predu for a ride. Well, as he should have. Because he's a shyster. Because George is pushing the prices through the roof. Let's talk about the art school. Okay. Because soon after, we go to the art school. Well, okay. So Felicity goes home. Yes. And she finds her safe open. And we get to see the Sims Art Center for no, the no. first time. Felicity goes Felicity home. Felicity goes home. And then Matilda goes to the art school. Now it's d- under cover of darkness here. Yes. So we only get glimpses of the object dart yes. in the lawn. 
The, the lawn art is fantastic. <laughs> and it is kind of creepy, that big building mm-hmm. where she's the only person there and stuff. Except she does have some... So Felicity goes home. And Matilda realizes the, the book has been stolen from her safe. So Felicity is in danger because and, that's the book that has all the information about the forgeries in it. And she calls her right away and Felicity's like, I'm not really in danger. And then gets killed. Yes. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> She locks one door with a that wasn't even closed before. She closes it. Okay, Patricia. Puts a little key in the door, and I'm completely safe now. Well, it's because Patricia is a witch because she can make doors appear and disappear at will, or maybe she can teleport. That's another thing because she teleports behind Anthony Predo mm-hmm. into a corner of a room that has no door. Or maybe she was already in Felicity's house, just waiting for her to come home. No, because there's the killer cam version of her. Oh, that's across true. She's the across street. the street. Assuming that that's killer cam. Yeah. Either way, she um, tortures Felicity. Yes. Who's an elderly lady by pressing her hand against a hot stove. Is this the worst torture that we've seen in Midsummer? Yeah. I think she may be the most despicable human being we've seen on Midsummer. Because she doesn't even have a good reason for no. doing Like she's not doing it to protect somebody, to save somebody else's life, because she's in love with someone. No. Nope. Because they're trying to take her livelihood. She does it because she's a nut. And she's greedy. Yes, and is infatuated with a guy who's been dead for years. Two two, two dudes have been dead for years, Hogson and Sims. She has no good reason to do what she does. She's just bad. So George informs Barnaby that there's torture. The scene I don't Barnaby- know why the skin stuck to the stove gave it oh. away. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like, doesn't that kind of... It goes without saying that she was tortured. I don't think she put her hand on the stove because she was freaking out. <laughs> and then there's a car, a car screech. And Matilda runs in trying to get in because she knows that Felicity Felicity was in danger. And, and she and Felicity are close. Yes. Now, Matilda is played by Susanna Harker. Yes. And she's been in lots of things. I think the first thing I saw her in was A Wire in the Blood. Yeah. With uh, Robson Green. Yeah. She was in one, two episode story of that. In this episode of Midsummer, she's supposed to be temptress deluxe the whole time. She's sexual. Yes. And I don't buy it. I'm actually pleased that she's not skinny, blonde. Yeah. Yeah. You're revealing right. Revealing clothes. Yeah. Like she is hippie sexual. She's a down to earth kind of person. If that's a word that I just made <laughs> up. <laughs> That perfectly Instead describes of metrosexual. Her. She's hippiesexual. That is a perfect okay. word to describe her. <laughs> because just the way she talks and everything is. I think she's just supposed to be a very free person. Yes, who's I not agree. restrained. Yeah, and says it like it is. Yeah, and prefers to says say things that are about sex a lot. And I like <laughs> that Midsummer makes her a real woman. She's mm-hmm. not young. She's not super skinny. She doesn't have uh, boobs that are disproportionate to her body. Yep. And she's not wearing a bunch of revealing clothing. No. So I actually like that part of it. You could be hippie sexual and not be like a vixen. She's just comfortable with herself, I think. I think that's And she was the raised by artists, yes. so that's who she is. Yes. And she has a lot of junk in her front yard. Well, <laughs> before we go to the art school and all of its wonderfulness, there is another place that is full of wonderment that I just want to mention really quickly, and that is the Hodgson, the Hogson Society store. Okay. And museum. Because they've got merch for Hogson that I never would have thought of. Books and DVDs. But the best by far are the Hogson glass cases. Yes. They just have his <laughs> signature on them in red. Yes. I also like the pencil cases. Pencil cases? Um, and the t-shirts that just say Hogson. Yep. And the mugs. Yep. And Lots now I want to know, what did they do with all that stuff? And I, why didn't they give it to us? I. <laughs> based on the fact that they put a sticker on a sweater. Yeah. I'm thinking those are all stickered. I don't know, but I think Patricia's full-time job there is just counting posters, counting prints. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six. Stack, stack. One, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six. Stack, stack. And the, the Hogson Museum is behind the store. Yes. And not only does it have Patricia's own artistic rendition of the man himself, but in the opposite corner, 
His hat and smock are on display. I did notice the Ooh hat la and la. smock. <laughs> And is easel. Yeah. But, you know, she just keeps these priceless uh, preliminary sketches in a drawer full of stuff that yeah. she shuffles around in and pulls it out. Like, If the painting is worth $500,000. Then that sketch that is worth sketch, at least five grand. At least five grand. Like, if I owned the painting, I would want to own that sketch, too. But she has lots to say about the art school, too. Oh, boy, does she ever. Degenerates. She hates Felicity. She does. How can you hate a little old lady that much? She does, and she doesn't hide it, even though she just killed her. She's just like, yes, I did hate her. I do hate her. She's awful. Yeah. <laughs> She's really bad. Whoever whoever killed her, that may not be a good thing, but whatever. I don't like her. There's not a lot of mystery to this episode. No, she's crazy lunatic so, right from the beginning. So sometimes I have to go to the end to see who who the killer is, right? Because I'm forgetting, we've, we've watched 68 episodes of this show. Yeah, and we've seen all these yeah. episodes a couple of times. So- it's easy to forget. But I remember I go, where I usually go back is just after the cold open to go to the end to look. And I got to the auction scene and I'm like, oh no, I know it's who the killer yeah, is. Yeah, it's definitely her. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Crazy lady. Her face is white and her eyes are red and bloodshot and, and wet. And she's obviously the killer. Oh, I wish I had a Henry Hogson class case. <laughs> You really want one. Okay, so now we can go to the art school because you know what they've got there? What? Nice rods. Yes, they don't have any (laughs) doors, though. Wow, what does that mean, nice rods? He's got fishing rods up on the wall. Oh, yes. And Jones is like anything but looking at that naked lady. (laughs) Who is Patricia? Yeah. (laughs) They did such a good job on that painting. That's actually a good painting. It is, but we will post a link to a to a picture of Sarah Bedell when she was about that age. Yeah. And that's what, she, I don't know if that's what all of her bits looked like, but that's what her face looked like. Yeah. It looks like her. They made that painting just for this episode yes. based on old pictures of her. Yes, and it's Absolutely. well done. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But Jones And the is naked just, painting is not lascivious. It's, it's nice. It's, it's artistic. It's artistic. But Jones is just like, I don't know where to look. I need blinders or something. And if you notice... <laughs> You notice, and I watched this a couple of times, they're all standing in front of the naked painting, Mm -hmm. right? So we have hippie sexual, Barnaby, and Troy is, uh, not Jones. Jones is in the background. He's looking at the picture, and then he points at the law, at the rods, (laughs) while still looking at the picture and goes, (laughs) nice rods. (laughs) I'm looking at those, those rods, not the naked lady. I'm not looking at the, what naked lady? I didn't even see a naked lady anyway. Okay. Then we get to go to the workroom. Yes. Where delinquents and former convicts are creating art. Art. (laughs) Now, we are open-minded about art. Oh, yeah. We have a giant picture of an octopus on one of our walls. Yeah. Right? We are open. I like experimental. I like abstract. abstract I like classic art. Yep. Yes. All of it. All of that. But I would own nothing that is being made in this room. So in the workroom are the following pieces of art. The pile of tires. Ropes and tires. Yes. Ropes and tires. The bike painting. Yes. There, where the artist is using a bike, not as a painting of a bike, no. but using the bike to paint. Just the tires. Yes. And his shoes. Yes. Mm. Okay. There's some people doing traditional abstract art. Mm-hmm. And then there's the gold mine. Well, there's also the thing over in the corner, which is some kind of wooden frame that has plastic wrapped around it. Yes. And then there is the shoe tree. Which is a tree with shoes stuck on it. Yeah. And the girl making it is like, hmm, I don't know. Should I put the pump here or the pink croc? Hmm. Yes. There is notably a pair of crocs on this. Bright pink crocs. Yes. I wonder if they collected those from the the crew. I think. Give us your shoes. Yep. (laughs) And somebody had those poor pink crocs on. Oh, no, please don't put my Crocs in. The, oh, you're going to put my Crocs in the scene. Okay. Yeah, But then the Sims Art School pushes it to 11. We go to the nude room. The nude, the the life drawing class. See, and this is the scene uh, with Matilda that bugs me. Oh. Because now I think instead of just being hippie sexual and being a free person, she's being confrontational with that sexuality. Yes. She says she has a nice body, doesn't she? 
Yeah, she does. She's like, I want you to look at her and yep. we're going to talk about her. Yeah. And whether you're comfortable with it or not. Yeah. Uh, it, it is. Unsaid. Barnaby handsel- handles it. Okay. Yeah. Jones, Jones does not. Does not. No. And I don't blame him. <laughs> He's like, oh my God, get me out of here. I got to go. I got to go. So we find out that Felicity was part of a menage. Yeah, she's so cool. She doesn't even have to say a toi at the end. Yeah. Just menage. With Matilda's dad and mom. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So obviously Felicity's Because her dad was just such a generous person. He had it's too much love to go around. Too much love to go around. I saw his picture. He doesn't strike me as that kind of person. No. He looks like a little shriveled Einstein without a mustache. She completely disowns Graham Spate here, though. She does. He's like an unfortunate uh, failure. And she was kind of mean to him at the beginning, too. Yeah. And then when he dies, it's like she's lost the love of her life. Yeah. I think it's a love-hate kind of thing. I think she, she does care for him, but knows that it's not good for her to care for him because he's a bad guy. They have one sign at the art school. It's for selling art supplies. It's, it for, it's on sale. It shows up four times. You know what else shows up several times? Arnold Sims painting. Yeah. It's in his studio upstairs, yes. right? That's where we first see it. Yeah. But then it's in the hallway on the stairs leading up to his studio. Yes. And then it's downstairs in the hallway. It's So either it's the traveling painting of the creepy shaved Einstein, or there's just duplicates all over the place, like Arnold mm. is watching you. Or... It's as if he made duplicate paintings for other reasons. Hmm. Hmm. Was he known to copy things? I don't know. Anyway, I don't think I'd want one version of that painting. Never mind three or four. So we go to the Frozen Food King's house. Yes, Alan Best's Hogson has been stolen. Yes. In the middle of the night, he's got his jammy jams on. He clearly sees the car that drives away and would have easily seen the plate. But... Still tries to shoot at it, even though it's probably a block away by then. Yeah. <laughs> like, even the first shot he takes is never going to hit that car. And the second one certainly isn't going to hit that car. Okay, so Colonel Sanders, you're telling me, is Irish. Mm-hmm. And now, the next day after the robbery incident, we're, we meet our next American. Christine Miller. Who insurance is... Insurance investigator. Is no, an, I'm sorry. She's a stock trader. Who isn't American either. No. Is anyone American in this episode? No. Okay. Not that I know of. But I will tell you something interesting about George Arlington, about Gavin O'Hurley before we move on. In Happy Days, remember how the Cunninghams had a son who was the oldest who kind of disappeared? Chet or Chuck? Chuck. Chuck. Was his name. Yep. And then they just sort of pretended that he never existed. Never existed. Uh, Gavin O'Hurley played him. Wow. Yeah. So he's American. No, he was born in Dublin, <laughs> raised in Dublin, went to college in Dublin. He's Chuck. But played Chuck Cunningham. Chuck. And, yes, Happy Days. Yes. Wow. As a kid, I remember, because Happy Days was on when I was a kid, going, where's Chuck? Yeah. Not only do they like send him off to college all of no, a sudden. No, they never make any mention of it. No, they send him off to college. But then later, when they're like, oh, how many kids do we have? It's like one it's less, like Joni, as if he never existed. Joni and Richie. And that's never it. never talk about Chuck. Yeah, Chuck doesn't exist anymore. No. Well, he was Gavin O'Hurley. Oh. Now you know. Now I know. Yeah, so so the Frozen Food King's Hogson has been stolen. Yes. He's beside himself. Yes. He does not know it's a fake. No, he doesn't know at that point in time it's a fake. No. So his insurance fraud doesn't begin now. No, but... Christine Miller is there because she's from a big fancy insurance company. She's an investigator. Yep. Right. So she pretends she's American. Yes. And tells everybody exactly the same story. Oh, the markets went all to hell. So I was delayed getting here from New York. I wonder what insurance investigators can get away with. Quite a bit. Really? Yes. Quite a bit. So (laughs) here's my rabbit hole of the episode. I thought, I wonder if they're actually allowed to go undercover like that. Like, how often does that actually happen? Yeah. Or do they hire, like, a PI to do that? So I went on the old Google Books and found Art Theft Forgery Investigation, the Complete Field Manual by Robert E. Spiel Jr. Wow. The latest edition is from 2000. Okay, well, the world hasn't changed in 20 years, so. 
Well, it 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 has a little footnote in the prologue that says that there are electronic resources online. Electronic resources. Yes. 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 Now, this is a 250-page book. Yep. That has six pages at the beginning on art, art history, and art appraisal. Well, six pages. You know, people get entire degrees in that. So in those three different things. Mm -hmm. So six pages is roughly all you need. There's a section called the thief's failure to act logically. Oh. Or when unimportant art is stolen. (laughs) Is it art if it's unimportant? (laughs) There's two pages that cover who did it, how, and why. Oh. Two pages. Two pages. And then there is this gem of a section called undercover. We will put a link in the show notes. To this <laughs> there are three kinds of undercover, right? Yeah. You can get a thief, like some somebody who's on the scene and dishonest to go undercover for you. But there's risks. Yeah. Then you could have a police person go undercover, but there's risks. There's a chart on this, by the way. Oh. Or the investigator can go undercover. There are risks there, too. Of course there are. But of the three of them, on this risk chart, the one that is most likely to be believed in court is the art investigator. Oh, okay. So Over if, cops. Yes, because they know both art and crime. Oh. So they're most often believed. Okay. They're also second best at convincing people that they are this other person. Okay. <laughs> Clearly, this is written by an investigator who Clearly. thinks investigators are the best. Clearly. Long story short, too late, I know. They are allowed to go undercover, but they seldom do it in this kind of way. They don't just like, I'm just going to go there and pretend to be somebody else and just see what I hear. They're more likely to go undercover as, a, as somebody who's selling something fishy rather than somebody who's buying something fishy because they want to catch people who would buy forgeries. Okay. Right, who are in that market. Because if you can catch, apparently, this is what I learned from Mr. Spiel, Spiel Jr., yeah. is if you can catch the purchaser, they're much more likely to squeal. Oh. So that's who you're after. It's like when you're trying to prosecute for prostitution. You want the Johns, but you arrest the prostitutes. Uh, so they'll rat out their John. Or drug dealers. You want the kingpin, you get the low-level guys. Are there interrogation questions in this uh, book? Oh, yes, there's an entire section on interrogation, depending on who it is that you're interrogating and what the scenario is. So much to learn from this book. Yes, it's a gold mine. It sounds like a great job, but I want to change my job to another job. Okay. I want to become a police detective so I can walk around in the afternoon looking at things with a hippie sexual. <laughs> Tom's doing research. He's building his knowledge about the the topic so that he can better investigate it. Okay. So by driving around in his car to random fields to see where paintings were painted with Matilda, the hippie sexual, he's learning. He also goes all academic. He gets a big pile of books and he goes to the library. Well, he goes to the research library, but he also just has a big pile of books on some table somewhere. Then he goes to the library. Either way, reading glasses are on bookmarks are out. He steals reference books from the library. He does indeed. (laughs) And he's not in the reference dungeon where we've seen him before. Right. This is a completely different case. So the reference dungeon is not useful. He almost crosses the librarian, the epic librarian. I have a question. And we're going to pause here with this question. Because if I'm wrong about this, we're going to cut this part. Mm -hmm. It's George at Bishop's Drift? Yes. Why? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. He has no reason to be there. He likes to fish. Maybe he knows something. Golf, fish? How many hobbies does George have? I don't know. He also goes to Italy or something for a month sometimes, but then can't go. The epic librarian played by Victoria Lennox has been in five Midsummers. Yes. She's a handsome woman. She's been woman in the audience. Yes. Mrs. Maitland, Doris Maple, librarian, and next... She will be a ghost walk tourist. Ghost walk tourist. Mm-hmm. She's been the librarian before, though. Okay. Clearly, she knows Tom and his antics. Yes. <laughs> a couple of the books include A Painter and His Landscapes, and the, the book that uh, Patricia wrote on Hodgins on mm-hmm. his desk, too. 
But what you can't do at a local library, maybe at a research library you can, but not at a local library. You can't just go up to the library and go, give me everything you got about pigs. Yeah, that that's not how libraries they work. They don't just go and retrieve it for you. No. They say, it's on shelf five in aisle yep. three. Look <laughs> under this Dewey Decimal number. Go find it your damn self. Yes. <laughs> But not when it's Tom, Tom, who uncovers the forgery all by himself, having no knowledge of Hogson, no knowledge of pastoral paintings, no knowledge of pigs prior to this epic research that he's done. In roughly 15 minutes. Yes. So Tom discovers yes. that the pigs are the anomaly. Yes. In the painting. So the pigs, They're the wrong pigs. They're a special type of pig that... Jones knows about right away. They're called Tamworth pigs. They're yes. orange. Yes. So they kind of stick out. Yes. And Tom discovers that they would not have been introduced to the UK in the year that this painting was supposedly painted. And he says they're called Tamworths for a special reason. He says they're named after Sir Robert Peel of Tamworth. Yes. Sir Robert Peel, who was prime minister twice. Yes. With a six-year break in the middle. I think it was six years. Yes. And isn't he also like the first... Um, uh, chief of police. Consta chief constable of, of police. Head of Met. Something. That's why they're called Peelers. Yeah. Because they're named after him. Yes. But it's not. that's not exactly right. No. It's close, but it's not exactly right. So what I learned from the Livestock Conservancy... Conservancy I also visited said site. Oh, you did. We do our research separately, so we never know. Is that, yeah, he he may have brought those pigs in from Ireland where he was from, but... They I'm, could have been there 100 years before that. Yeah, well, and they really weren't... They're named after where he brought them. They're named after Tamworth, not necessarily because of him. Yeah. But because of that's where the breeding program started that crossed the Tamworth pigs with the local pigs. Yes. And 80 years later, established an official new line of pigs. So the evidence there is a little rough, right? Because it's not an exact date or anything like that. Mm. I would suggest the evidence for spay casting is much stronger to date the painting incorrectly. Well, date we, we do the know... The other painting. Yeah, we do know that, that the first Tamworth pigs were brought to England after Hogson supposedly died. Yes. That's clear. Yeah. Now, when they officially became a breed... Uh, so we're talking later. about two paintings here. One yeah. is called Midsummer Meadow. Right. That's the one with the pigs in it. And the feckin' children. Yes. <laughs> Fecund. Fecund. So, which means, like, pick, fertile. Picking up the feckin' growing. roots. Yes. <laughs> so they could put them in their feckin' holes. <laughs> and then we have... Um, Bishop's Drift, which is the painting that went on auction with the fishing, where, where the bishop fishing. is fly fishing. And the way he is fly fishing is called spay casting. So I went down a rabbit hole on spay casting. <laughs> How interesting is it? Well, I watched a masterclass video by Ian Gordon on spay casting. So, what, so maybe then you can explain this to me because I know, I've, I mean, fly fishing has a long line and you fling the line. And you, you know, t pull it in because it's supposed to simulate like a fly in the water and that gets the fish's attention. I understand that. What I don't understand is why the freeze frame of somebody casting is so specialized. Because okay. to me, it just looks like he's casting. Okay. Things I learned. <laughs> first you know of, more about it than you want to know? First of all, Ian Gordon. He's an interesting dude. He's a professional salmon angler. Oh. And a former spay casting champion. Oh. Okay. The thing I learned, well, a couple of things I learned from watching this video. And I'll post the video on, on the... Uh, the notes? The notes. Yeah. So you can see what I'm talking about. First of all, the spay casting is a thing you can't do from the shore. You have to be in the water to do it. Because you draw the uh, line completely out of the water on the backstroke which must be at the same angle as the forward stroke. And the whole line must be behind the angler. Now, if you were on land, especially where the bishop is, it would get all caught up in all the, the land. Yeah, so the bishop's not spay casting because he's clearly on the bank. No, he's not spay casting. <laughs> Oh. Spay casting originated at the heart of Scotland in the mid-1800s and therefore 
was developed so successfully because people did it in the River Spey, which is in northern uh, Scotland. And it's officially like 1850 when yeah. it's established yeah. as a kind of casting method. So I looked at the Spey River. It's a very interesting little river. Oh, yeah? It's very nice. And I, I went through it on Google Maps, and there's lots of areas where you could actually do fly fishing. I can see why it was a, a fly fishing area. Now, when they go to the river with Hippiesexual, when yes. Tom and Hippiesexual go to sea, yes. there is a dude in the water wearing his waders. And he could do spay casting. And he casting. could be spay casting. But if the bishop's doing it in the painting, he's doing it wrong. Yes. And is that the whole point? Is I, that he's not in the water, so he's doing it, he's not doing it correctly, and... I don't know. He's doing a cast that he couldn't have done? Because these are regulation 22-foot rods. I went into this. Nice rods. <laughs> If it's regulation 22-foot rods, the line is usually twice or three times the length of the rod. Yeah. Right? So, And there's a tree right there. Doing it would definitely get at the bridge is also a stupid... Probably, yeah. <laughs> Any actual fly fisherman must have screamed at the episode. <laughs> because, so there are things that we do, and I, we've talked about this before. I do audio, so whenever... Somebody steps up to a microphone and immediately gives feedback. I'm You're like, like, ah, it doesn't happen. Doesn't work like that. And also, because we're academics and related to academ academia, we're constantly talking about how, like, a Sheldon on that stupid American sitcom show never actually teaches a class. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is, again, a thing. Like, academia is misportrayed, but the, the fly fishermen people must have been insane when they said specifically that this was spay casting and that he was doing it in the way he was doing it in the position he was doing it. Unless that's the point. Yeah. That he is clearly not fishing correctly. He's doing something that he would not have been able to do because it hadn't been invented yet, and he's doing it wrong. From what I can see from the video, this is my own interpretation. The best place to go spay casting is when you have a river that's wide. Right. Okay. And that is not deep, mm -hmm. especially if it's not deep on one side so that you can kind of cast into the river mm -hmm. where it's flowing deeper than where you're standing. Yeah. So and this that, is more like a creek. I don't even know why they call it a river. Yeah. It's like maybe 10 feet across. Yeah. That you could not spay cast in that. You could fly fish, I'm sure, but not the way these, you know, Ian Godson was not, Ian Gordon was not consulted on this. <laughs> they didn't get a fishing expert in to, to inform it. Huh? Anyway, all that will be in the show notes as well. Yeah. Now we made you sit through it. You can also consult the well, show notes for more. It's only two and a half minutes. He's not the greatest teacher of how to do this. <laughs> It's more of an introduction to spay casting than how actually to do it because he's one of these experts who's like, oh, and you just do this. Yeah. And now, a special holiday message. Psst. Hey, you. No, not you. You. This message is for the people listening only because their spouse or friend, partner, or coworker really loves Midsummer Murders and somehow talked you into watching the show and listening to this podcast just to make them stop asking you. That's who I'm talking to, okay? Now that I've got your attention, you might want to get your Midsummer Maniac and residents out of the room somehow. Tell them you saw a flyer down in the corner for like a suspicious village fate or maybe a club that Joyce Barnaby's a member of. They'll go check that out right away. Okay, they're gone. Now that we know you're listening, we know you're here not because you're a fan of the show, but because you're a fan of a person who likes the show. You know, that person that you just shoved out of the house. We at the Midsummer Maniacs podcast are here to help you because you're obviously a great person. We want to make your favorite maniac happy for the holidays and simultaneously get them to stop talking to you about that murder show they really like. Why not get them some Midsummer Maniac merch? We've got t-shirts, sweatshirts, tote bags, face masks, you name it, we've got it. Plus a brand new Nine Ways to Die in Midsummer poster. They'll like that stuff, right? Not only will you be giving one of your favorite people a great gift, all the proceeds go to Direct Relief to provide medical supplies to people around the world in need. But here's the best bit. If you get a Maniac t-shirt for your favorite Maniac, or a sweatshirt, really anything, from the Maniac's line, there's a chance that they'll be identified in the wild by another Maniac. Then they can talk to each other about the show and leave you alone. It's a win-win-win. 
Just go to shop.spreadshirt.com slash midsummer dash maniacs dash podcast to see what we've got. Okay, you can let them back in now. It might be cold out there, or who knows, they might be a village murderer on the run. Thanks. So now Tom knows their forgeries. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. And he's on the hunt for who's responsible for these forgeries. Who knows about them? Well, unfortunately, he's not the only one on And the who's hunt. making money out of it? Because Patricia's on the hunt, too, and she finds poor Graham. <sighs> Knocks him on the head with a wine bottle. Whammo. Puts him over his own kitchen table, ties his hands to the legs of that table. Which I think he could not get free there. No, I thought about that. Yeah. I thought he could have slid his body to one side, maybe, and then his arms would still be way out of whack, yeah. right? Yeah. So he couldn't get far if he was like trying to drag the table, but she knocks him out. And then they say that he's been hit over the head, but she's got a razor. She's got a straight razor. Yeah. And she's cutting 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 at him him to get him to talk. It is brutal. I mean, there's blood splatter on the painting. That's a few feet away. This is a blood. uh, There's more blood in this episode than naked bits. To make it worrisome. Yes, I agree. Yeah, if you're talking about things that could be bothersome, the blood is way, way worse than the naked bits. Yeah, especially Anthony's death. (laughs) But we don't see it. No, we don't see it. But we see a lot of blood splatter. Speaking of Anthony, they go confront him. But before before that, Graham has an interesting house. We need some help. Remember we mentioned Cold Comfort Farm last episode? Yes. He kind of lives at Cold Comfort Farm too, His right? house is a mess. It's a, it's purposefully messy on the inside, but in reality, it's a rather a nice farm. Yeah. But they've cluttered it up inside. He's got a couple things I can't even identify. Yeah, two things that we're like... There's a statue on a, a Welsh dresser in his kitchen. And again, this will be in the show notes. We'll, we'll give you the picture. You can look at it, too. It looks like a squash with a hat and some teeth holding a carrot. <laughs> and then there's some sort kind of... of? <laughs> there's some kind of device in his living room that might be a kettle or might be a clothes steamer or might be something completely yeah, different. I don't know. we couldn't figure out what it was. It's behind the treadmill, though. Yeah. Because Graham has a treadmill. Well, you know, crime pays as well as being creative. Yes. <laughs> it's it's just, yeah, it's bad. But it fits him, I guess, you know. I guess. He's not a well-to-do guy, and he's not a sophisticated guy. So it's probably a family farm with accumulated junk. Yeah. Prideau tells Tom that he should attend to items that are more within his intellectual grasp. Yeah. We don't like it when Tom gets hit. No. We don't like it when Tom gets yelled at. No. We certainly don't like it when Tom is put upon by inferiors. Neither does Tom. No. His face is fantastic. He's like, mm. it's like, a that's not going to fly, mister. You're not getting away with that. Yeah. I'm not going to be intimidated by you. And he basically- Look here, big ears. Yes, you are. Because you're a thief and you're a bad guy. Yep. And you're, <laughs> you know that these paintings are fake. Yeah, he's so incredibly dishonest. Yeah. Just for the purpose of profit. The best part is Anthony didn't know the painting was fake until he got the call from Graham. Yeah. Okay, so this is one of my questions about this episode. Maybe you can help me with it. Yeah. When they confront Prudeau in his gallery after he insults Tom and Tom tells uh, Jones to search the place, they confront him and Jones says, Tom says, I know everything. Or something like that. Yep. And then he says, well, how do you know? And Joan says, Spate told me. And I think he's faking. He's faking it. He's definitely faking. They don't know anything. They don't know anything. He's totally bluffing. Yep. Okay. That's what I thought. I wanted to see if you thought that too. Yep. And if they are bluffing, that's good. They did a good job. Yep. We know it's not George who kills Anthony because he's an American drinking American alcohol at the bar. Oh, you know what's funny? How rich okay. do you have to be to be given just a big bottle of Jack Daniels? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. When you said earlier, is George at the river? I thought you were talking about George Arlington. Were you talking about George the coroner? I think so. But 
now I realize it was George Arlington. It was, was yeah, because re- he's standing out there with a half a million painting, half a million dollar painting, just holding it, looking around. Why is he at the river? Because he's admiring where his painting was painted. Okay, that makes sense. Which is why he's got the incredibly valuable thing in his hands, just oh. standing out there in the mud. Okay, I'm gonna leave all this in because I love that confusion. <laughs> That confusion's great. That's why you call them by their last names. Yep. Because I, I said, maybe it's just, maybe he's a fisherman. Maybe it's his hobby. And you were like, and golf too? And I thought, how do you know George Arlington golfs? Did he yeah. mention golfing? Okay, that part I'm going to cut out. <laughs> <laughs> now you got to leave it all in. <laughs> no. <laughs> Whoa, wow. Okay. Spate's house gets completely turned over. Poor Graham, he's over the kitchen table, he's hogtied. Patricia has sliced him up like a Christmas ham because she's evil. So what does Tom do? He grabs the painting that's spattered in blood, no gloves, <laughs> no nothing, drives it over to um, uh, the house of, oh, what's his name? Uh, we really, Best. Sorry, we, I keep wanting to call him smart. We really miss the magazine at this point. I know, when we have the pictures yep. of your name. But so he takes it over to Frozen Food King's house and is like, hey, look, I got your painting back. Yay. And and he's like, um, I OK, I guess, because he knows it's a forgery and he was going to get more money from the insurance. How does he it know it's worth. a forgery? Then? He knows at that point because he and Graham were in on it because Graham stole it from him. Yeah. For that purpose. And Alan says that they were in on it. OK. Right. Yeah. Okay, so what happens is Graham steals the black book, right? Okay. He knows their forgeries. He goes to Alan and says, hey, we can both make some money. I'll yep. steal your painting. We'll split the money. And then he tries to go to um, Purdue and blackmail him about it, too. That's right. And he tries to blackmail Arlington. Really, he causes Why is so he much blackmailing Purdue? Because Purdue. Pur- Purdue. Purdue, sorry. Purdue. Because Prudhoe has been selling forgeries. Oh, okay. okay. Right? Yeah. And that's why when Alan gets the painting back, when the frozen food king gets the painting back, he knows exactly how to tell you that it's a forgery. He knows those are the Beatles. Yes. Because Graham has told him from the book. Yes. <laughs> I figured it all out. See, I laid it all out there for you. You with me now? Do you think they had to ask permission to put use the Beatles like that? No, because they don't look like the Beatles. They look no. like four guys in a line. They're going in the right direction. I checked. And two of them are wearing whitish clothes. Yeah, I checked. But it's not like there's crossing lines underneath them. There's not no. zebra lines underneath them. No. That would be really weird. <laughs> it would In be. a pastoral painting, there's just these white crossing lines there. So they so confront we- Best about Graham. And yeah. he says, like he pretends he doesn't know him. Yeah. And then he says, oh, that local tea leaf. Yes, which is a thief. Which is rhyming slang for a thief, which tells you what you need to know about Best, that he's yep. not a fancy guy. That's not, not fancy. He's worked his way up the ladder, yep. right? He's an entrepreneur. And he destroys the painting in front of his wife. After ta- after touching it with his bare hands, with Graham's still wet blood spattered oh. on it. Why is nobody like, ooh, blood? At least Yvonne Best is like, I'm going to go get a J-cloth and wipe it off. Like, okay, first, if it's a real painting, no, don't do that. And second of all, J-cloths have better uses than that. Blood, uh. Okay, so J-cloths, is that, it, are Americans aware of what a J-cloth is? I only know what J-cloths are because I like British TV. Okay, so they're like, they're thicker than a wipe. They're semi-disposable cleaning cloths. That's what they are. Yes. Yep. Like dishcloths that you can use a few times before you throw them out. But in any woman of a certain age in England and Canada, I would say any cloth is a J-cloth. Right. Any kind of dish rag or whatever. Yep. It's all a J-cloth. And the gloves, they call them marigolds, right? Yeah. Because they're yellow. So you get your J-cloths and your marigolds and you're ready. Yeah. So they find, they find the photos at Graham's house of Graham and Matilda doing the kissy kissing. Who took those pictures? Another art student. The shoe tree lady, maybe? Maybe. Maybe it was shoe tree lady. Okay. Maybe it was tire rope guy. Who knows? I don't know. They find them. And Barnaby is kind of stumped. Like, how does this guy who's a convict win over somebody like Matilda? And Jones says he must have known his way around the ladies. Yes. <laughs> Not maybe he had a way with the ladies. No. 
He knows his way around a lady. A lady. Like he's got a good map. He's got a good map. He knows where things are. Yep. He's seen the landmarks. And that's all it takes. Yep. Yeah. Well, he's got that painting for reference. Yes. In the foyer of the <laughs> art school. Maybe that's where he learned his way around. Maybe. Those are feet. Good dad. Okay. Okay. Now we have to confront Matilda and she spills the beans about her dad forging the paintings and then giving her several after he died so that she could sell them when she needed money. They're like a little savings account for her, but yeah. all based on forgery and, and, and bad. And they all have little things in them so that he could kind of get away with saying they were forgery. If he was ever confronted, he could say it's not a forgery because yeah. I did things that clearly indicate that it's not real. Yeah. And all you have to do is know what to look for. Yes. It's a pastiche. Pastiche. Of Hogson. Okay. Not a forgery. And they're, you know, they're not really forgeries anyway, because they're not copies of existing paintings. No, they're, they're not. not duplicates. They're originals in the style of Hogson. And if somebody wants to pay $40,000 to a hippie sexual for it, go mm-hmm. for it. Or 500000 Exactly. Anthony's Prideaux's death is problematic. He's got the black book. Yes. Because he's taken it from Graham. Graham. How many paintings are there? I don't know. Because that book easily has 250 pages. Well, there, but there's like a full page sketch of each anomaly that he's put in. Okay. Like so, there's several pa- so several pages just for the one painting. Let's cut it in fifths. Well, we know she's got three or four still, even though she says she doesn't. And, and she's already sold. And he said a, at least four or five was in his collection. Yeah. So there's Colonel probably Sanders a dozen. Is, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, and so she spills the beans. She's like, look, my dad painted these as a, a safe, you know, yep. he didn't, he didn't be- want to become a forger. He accidentally became a forger. So Anthony has the book now, which makes him a target. Yes. By crazy lady. Right. Okay. Who materializes behind him and slits his throat and takes the book. Okay. In front of the big glass storefront, because his desk is right there. Yes. There is no door behind him. You don't know there's not a back door to that store. There's got to be a back no, no. door. He is in a corner, okay? I looked at okay. this. Okay. And she comes up behind him. Yes. Okay. But he's facing the front of the store, and so she just snuck up somehow. It's out of nowhere. <laughs> but what's problematic is when they show the shot of him lying across the desk, when Tom looks back at it, mm-hmm. there's a f-ing door there. Ah! <laughs> they added a door after the fact i don't know how it works patricia added the door on her way out <laughs> she's like i know i've just killed somebody but let me get my tools out here and i make like, a door i was like i was like okay this is gonna show wait a minute there's a door there <laughs> <laughs> and then when uh, Arlington comes in there like, look, look at the corpse. Look at the corpse. Now, don't look at the corpse. Turn away. <laughs> Guess what? No door there. It goes away again? It's the magic door. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch all those scenes again because I don't believe you. I think they covered it up. They put like a screen in front of it and then they moved the screen for it's the socos. It's got bookshelves and art in front of it. <laughs> Oh, it's a magical door. Boy, well, there's a lot of blood. Uh, there would be. Anthony Prideaux, the guy who plays him is, what's his name again? David Bamber. David Bamber shows up, does like four scenes and is out. That's all he's got to do. He is the the vansitard of this episode. Yes, he's a good actor. He can yeah. do that. Yeah. But man, Arlington is like upset. Like he's like, whoa, that guy. Wow. Yeah. Colonel Sanders, who probably would have seen lots of death and dying because he's American. And it's all over. <laughs> we just willy nilly kill each other in the streets is, all the time. Is yeah. Really upset here. He is. Yeah. And you would be. And then he gets the letter. Now, if you think Patricia can magically make doors, what she can do in a library is just black magic witchcraftness. Patricia is a witch. <laughs> this is what we've learned from like this a pointy hat ride a broom witch yes. not a you know i i respect the forces of nature kind of witch no 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 no. we're talking like evil fairy tale witch yes so okay she writes the letter and she somehow comes up with this plan this is the worst it's plan. a horrible plan for a money drop oh right it's in a public place. Never mind that she materializes in the hotel and slides in under Arlington's door with nobody seeing her. Yeah. 
nobody like. She and who can, doesn't know who this woman is in Costa? Yeah, and okay, she she's a force of nature. They open, know who she is. Yeah. So the note says, "I want two million dollars for, and I'll give you the black book." Yes. Right. Two million pounds for the black book now, because Arlington has all of his money tied up in this huge Hogson collection, and nobody will ever know that half of them are fake if he has the black book. Now, Prado offered him a million dollars for the black book. How did she know that? To Asked for two million? I don't know. Maybe she found the notes on Prudeau's desk or something. Or maybe she heard them through the wall door. <laughs> she can just, you know, draw a door on the wall with chalk and magically it becomes a real door that she can listen to. Her through. name's Simon. <laughs> <laughs> the thing she draw comes true. Yes, yes. Hello, my name is Simon. So her her whole idea here, okay, yep. is that Arlington is going to put the money in a shopping trolley. Yeah. Put some fake groceries on top and take it to the library okay. where the tables are numbered and are five feet away from the librarian. Okay. Never have I been in a library where the tables were numbered. No. Especially with little paper cards. Now, I have been in, in a university library where they were numbered. Okay. And where the carols were numbered because you could reserve them. Yes. Right? Okay. But not in the Costin Public Library. Second of all, okay, he gets the $2 million way too quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he's wealthy, but come on, that's a lot of cash. But more importantly. He doesn't have to get it at all. He doesn't need to get that money at all. They just need to put newsprint in that bag. They could put anything in that trolley. Yep. Because what's she going to do? Yeah. He's got the book. So then she goes to the library, which has a finite number of entrances and exits. It is a small library as well. Of which the police could watch all of. Yes. She's already there, but she's got her magical gray wig on. Wow. No one can recognize her if she's got her magical gray wig on. Yep. Never mind. She's got the same big earrings on. Yes. Never mind. Magical so gray wig. So she leaves... The black book on the table. Mm -hmm. But Jones Her, doesn't see her do it. No. She's sitting at the little table pretending to be an old lady. Also a ninja. And then magically. She's a winja. <laughs> 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 then magically, Patricia, the black witch ninja, I think she flings the book. Like a throwing star? Yeah, I think Boom. she just flings it Boom. exactly right yep. so that it lands on the other table at the far end. Silently. Silently, okay. right? So that when Arlington comes in with the shopping trolley. So Colonel Sanders comes in with his shopping trolley. Yes. And there's one there. No, there's no trolley there yet. Okay. He brings it in. Now, where did he get the shopping trolley? I don't know. They just picked a shopping trolley. Yeah. Okay. Maybe there's a store there on the high street that sells identical shopping trolleys and, for everyone. Oh, okay. So that's where Patricia got the identical shopping trolley. She must have. Okay. Because it's got the same plaid lining. Wow. This is problematic. <laughs> yeah. Now, if she had given him the note and the shopping trolley, I'd be okay with it. But then she could have an identical one to swap it with. If, and nobody would know. If you did that, wouldn't you be going, mm, I guess we're looking for an identical shopping trolley. <laughs> Or, Patricia, why are you buying two shopping trolleys? And then Patricia's her husband, Patsy McPatson, <laughs> known as Neville, bloody Neville Blackshaw, she says later, comes and gets the... Because Patricia <laughs> is forgetful and she left her groceries at the library. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> so he works around the corner and so he thought, oh, I'll just pop over there and retrieve the groceries. <sighs> And we find out that in the shopping cart, it's been replaced. It's just groceries. It's just groceries. There's some onions and stuff. And that Patricia is making her escape. Yeah. She sneaks out of the front door of the library with her magical wig of disguise. And nobody notices her. No one. I think she had the shopping trolley under her, co under her coat while she's she was there in the library. Like magical she's got, ninja she's witch. She's got like a... Um, you know those bottomless bags you can get in D&D &D that you yes. can put anything in? A bag of holding. She has a coat of holding. She has a coat of holding. <laughs> she had the cart in there, and then she just shuffled over, opened her coat, uncovered the trolley, and shuffled back. I guess. And put the new trolley in her coat. And then it disappeared also. Until she needed to push it out of the library so nobody would see her. So that she could get in her car and then laugh maniacally as she drove. <laughs> <laughs> I would have at least said put it in one duffel. 
Like, don't give me five different shopping bags with money in them. I can't possibly you can care. clearly see they are bags full of money. What is this private plane place? They don't ask questions. They don't. <laughs> they don't. I private gotta, pilots do not ask questions. I got to think as a private plane concierge, I would like go, we can't let you on the plane and do that. Well, she's already booked it in advance. So they're ready for her. So did they ask for a deposit? Because I would think they would ask would for a deposit. I think they would. And she probably used the $120,000 that the society raised to pay off so her deposit. that's where it went. Because one of the things I was going to ask in so after What do they the do with the money? Is what happened to that hundred? dollars Yeah, do they have to give it back to the people who donated it? Or I do they know. get to keep it? Did you recognize Melanie, who no. greets her and gets her on the plane? No. Same actress. Can her I carry your bags? Her no. name is Victoria Chalet. She played Julia Carter in The Murder on St. Mally's Day. She's the girl, the towny girlfriend of the kid that gets killed oh. in the St. Mally's Day race okay. by the spoon man. Yeah. Yeah. She's his girlfriend. Oh. Same okay. actress. Okay. But I don't think it's the same person because her name was Julia. But it would be weird if this character's name was Julia. Also, I know what would foil <laughs> this plan now. Anything? Brexit. Yes. <laughs> Because there's There'd no, be some customs stuff going on before she could get on that plane and when she got off the plane. And maybe those bags of money might be questioned. <laughs> you just can't travel with big plastic bags full of money. You know, I You're bet... You're going to get spot checked. I bet you there are extremely wealthy people who do weird things like that all the time. I would not be surprised if a private pilot just keeps his mouth shut, keeps his eyes closed... But they still have to go through immigration. Now, Brexit would make it more difficult. This yeah. episode is foiled by Brexit. Yeah, because when they're in the EU, right? Farage is like, I told you it was a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> Patricia would vote for stay. See? <laughs> you could get away with it, Patricia. <laughs> Boris Johnson's like, no, you're going to be foiled by Brexit and your bags of money. Groceries, bags of money, plane. <laughs> Is it a Dora the Explorer episode? No, it's their <laughs> silly <laughs> pandemic three-word solutions to everything. Oh, uh, yeah. So she's going to fly off to Florence. Yes. But Techie Barnaby has put a transponder in the money. And walks in front of the window in I killer fashion. love that scene. Yep. She's looking out the window like, ha ha, I have all this money in a bottle of Evian water they put here just for me and I'm petting my money in my bag. And then he just like slides into the window frame looking at her and she's like, drats, foiled again. She kisses the money. Like she has more of a relationship with the money than her husband. I might kiss that money too. I have to admit, <laughs> I might. If I just had a bag of $2 million like that, and I hadn't just killed people for it, but like if it was legitimately mine, all of a sudden it was mine, I might kiss it just a little. Did Not you, tongue kisser, just a little smooch. Did you notice how Colonel Sanders has really freckly hands? He's a red haired guy. He's got freckly everything. Yeah, I he's got freckly everything. He's freckled Colonel Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> Which is better than being fickened. Fickened Colonel <laughs> Sanders. <laughs> and you're oeuvre. So. There's a little sound design thing here. I don't know if you noticed it. It was really quick. So they take her into the interrogation room that's not the interrogation room. It's just room an office at the airfield. At the cop shop and not the interrogation room at the library where right. they interrogate Colonel Sanders. Yes. It's the interrogation room at the airport. Yes. Notice a problem here with this episode. Yes. But there's they have there's a little sound of an airplane leaving. To say, we are still at the airport. We also yes. have toy airplanes around the room. Yes, and they have left yes. without her. They've gone. Why? Why? They go now, you don't know if it's that plane. No, it could be any plane. But it implies that. No, it doesn't. It just implies that they're still at the airport. She denies things for about 30 seconds and then is like, yeah, I did it. No, she doesn't deny anything. She just denies that anything she did was wrong. <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> She's like, all I did was for the honor of Hogson, and if that's a crime, then I'm, his reputation. then I'm guilty. <laughs> you killed and tortured three, three people. people. You are a bad person. Yeah. It was all jam. I had sexual adventure. No, I could have had a bohemian lifestyle and sexual adventure. Instead, I had jam Jerusalem and bloody Neville Blackshaw. 
you live that choice, lady. <laughs> now, we've seen her before. Okay. You should not be surprised by Sarah Bedell's acting skills here. Okay. Because she was in Death of a Hollow Man as Els... Uh, what's his name? Elson? Yes. The guy who slits his throat on stage? She's yes. his ex-wife. Isling. Essling is Essling. his name. Remember how bitter and nasty she yes. is in that? Yes. She's good at that role. Yes, she is. And man, I, I think her confession may be one of the best confessions in Midsummer. The way she tells her side of the story. Your bourgeois mind. Is so twisted up. Yep. And to, you know, there she's not a young woman. No. And Felicity certainly is not a young woman. No. So to have her be jealous that Felicity had sex with somebody 50 years ago and she's still pissed off about it. Yeah. Like, haven't you had a life since then? No, just jam Jerusalem and bloody Neville Blackshaw. Yep. So pissed off about that. Which is her choice. Yes. But she was in love with Arnold Sims and he painted her naked and she's been scarred ever since. Whatever. No, no, you're a loony lady. So Colonel Sanders... Gives them back the black book. Yeah, just when you think it's over. And then asks for a cab ride. This ending, this double ending here. Is smart. Is the way it should be. Mm -hmm. Not the way the last double ending was. Right. Which was kind of stupid. Yeah. His taxi peels out. Zoom. I think, oh, it's not a taxi. Like, But he asked them to call it, so he couldn't have arranged it. But instead of going to the airport like he says he's going to, he goes to the Sims Art School and they think he's going to go attack. Matilda's all alone there. Hippie sexual Matilda. Yeah. She's there cleaning up all the shoes. That they just leave everywhere. Oh. No, she, they're there with a bonfire inside the house. Who burns stuff inside the house? And I'm sorry, she's burning the remaining forgeries, which are oil paintings. That would smell and smoke and it would be Bad. And be damaging. It would damage her father's art that he she loved. It would also set the alarms off. Oh, gosh. I hope they have fire alarms there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they do have convicts and delinquents in residence. And so what has happened is Colonel Sanders stole the black book, replaced mm -hmm. it with another black book. Never mind how he knew what black book it looked like. He miraculously had an identical one, just like the identical trolley in his pocket. I think maybe Patricia and Arlington both have access to an item duplicator. Oh. <laughs> so he picks up one and he goes, puts it in his pocket and then gives the police a different one. He goes and makes her a deal. Now, wouldn't you have scribbled in that book or something when you handed it over to the police? So at I least if they opened it, they something. wouldn't immediately see yeah. that it was just blank. Okay. The deal he makes is he's going to get rid of his fakes, mm -hmm. which she trusts him to do. Yeah. And she's going to get rid of the fakes they have here, and they're going to burn the book. Yes. So all the evidence of forgery will be gone. Yeah. And I believe him. They missed something here that I would have done if I had written this scene. Okay. He arrives with two bags of money. Mm -hmm. I would have had him leaving with one bag of money and Matilda turning and going inside the house and looking at the bag and smiling. So he would have given her a million dollars? Yep. Why would he do that? Because uh, that was part of the deal. Because she's in control of that deal. Mm. She has the black book. He does. Well, sorry. She has the extra fake painting. Yeah. She could ruin him. No, he can ruin her because he's the only one with the evidence that they're fakes. He he's, makes a deal with it. See, I think he's in charge of that situation. They don't make anything it's illegal It's here. mutually beneficial to yeah. them to rid the world of the fakes. Yeah. Right? And I, I just like the idea that he leaves her a little money, too. Yeah. It would have been a cute way to end it. Yeah. And if, but, you know, and, he did uh, just give her 498,000 pounds. Yes. <laughs> Minus the two, grand, the two grand that Felicity wanted to keep. Though maybe she'll get that now too because Felicity didn't go get to go on her trip. Plus, she probably inherits everything from Felicity's estate. Yeah, which includes that million dollar mansion that she lives in. That's a cottage. Yeah, that has one door. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> oh then, boy. And then hippie sexual makes one more move on Tom. I'm gonna teach a course on hugs, and you should come to my course. Why is Tom. she making moves on Tom? And Tom's like, no, but my wife will. Ha 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 ha. But he does kiss her on the cheek. I'm like, ah, Tom, don't yeah. do that. Don't encourage her. Yeah. And so he, Tom gives uh, Joyce, who's also in this episode, mm -hmm. by the way, 
uh, the Hogson course. And she's very happy. Yep. And he must have written her name on the front of it. Yeah. <laughs> she's so interesting. She certainly is. Oh, she is. She certainly is. And that's it. Okay, best corpse. <laughs> nice corpse. Is it Felicity, Graham, or Prideau? Uh, Prideau, we don't see his face. No. I, I gotta say it's Graham. I do too. Because he's tied to that thing and head down head all that down time and, and hands tied up and blood everywhere. That's not a comfortable position to be in. No. No. Definitely not. Now the burn makeup on Felicity's hand is really well done. Yes, it is. But I have to say that Graham is the best yeah, corpse. I'm going I agree with, with Graham there. too. Okay. After the credits, okay. Matilda inherits Felicity's stuff and has the money so the art school can go on. Neville is sad, lonely, has no real answers. Maybe also bankrupt. I don't know. Maybe I think Neville's probably pretty happy. But Trish is going to go to prison and he's finally rid of her and gets to have a life. But he has no answers other than she was crazy. Yeah. And I didn't notice. That's all there is to know. <laughs> I mean, that's all there is to know. But Colonel the- Sanders goes back to America, opens up a few more restaurants. He's fine. Now, do you think Alan Best gets charged with insurance fraud or attempted insurance fraud? Or do you think he's off the hook? I think he's pretty much off the hook because he fesses up to it right away. Yeah, and he doesn't get the money. And he doesn't try to get the money. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't try to to continue to pull off the scam. When he got the money, where he had underinsured the painting anyway. Yeah, that's true. So, yeah, I think he's fine. Him and Yvonne go sell more frozen food and buy more paintings. Christine Miller gets to go back to her insurance agency and say she solved the case. Yep. Who else do we have? Oh, the admirer and the librarian. Yeah, maybe they get together. (laughs) That's it. That's everybody. Yeah. Are you ready for horrible movies? I bet Mark's seen. I'm ready for horrible movies. I bet Mark's seen. This movie is terrible. Ha, I bet Mark's seen it. Oh boy, do I have doozies for you this week. Okay. And I'm staying. I've already said it. I'll say it again right now. I'm going to be four, four, four okay. on this one. Okay. okay. So the first movie um, has uh, Christopher Fuller in it. He plays Alan Best in okay. this episode of Midsummer. And here is a description of this 2002 okay. movie. Yes, I am saying a 2002 movie that you will not know. A lead detective being stalked by a serial killer is asked to check into a clinic treating law enforcement agents who can't face their jobs. Oh, I've never heard of this movie. What is this movie? It stars Sylvester Stallone and Chris Christopherson. What? Yeah. What is this movie? It's called I See You. E-Y-E. See You. This movie didn't actually exist. You're making it It was released overseas as Detox. D-T-O-X. Yeah, I've never heard of that movie. It's a real movie, and wow. I get a point. Woohoo! Cha-ching! I never even heard about that. That was movie. the one I was not totally confident about. Yeah. <laughs> the other three, I got you. Okay. All right, the next one is a 1970 movie. Okay. And Sarah Bedell, who plays Patricia Blackshaw, the killer, yep. in this episode, is in this movie. Yes. A man working at an ad agency has to come up with a marketing campaign for frozen porridge. I'll even tell you who it stars. It stars Marty Feldman, the guy with the weird eyes. Oh, I know. Who plays? Right. He plays uh, Igor yeah. in um, Young Frankenstein. Yes, right. I I know you know that, but the listeners might not know yes. who he is. No, no idea. It is called Every Home Should Have One. No, never seen that. Woohoo! Two that. for two, baby. Two for two, baby. Oh. The next one is a 1995 film. Okay. And Gavin O'Hurley is in it. He played Arlington in this episode. Yeah. This is quite the description of this movie. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. The ambassador of Cuba is killed in New York. To prevent another attack of the terrorists at the U.S. Cuba summit in Prague, the CIA sends one of their best federal agents. The suspected killer is a lesbian club owner. But as usual, everything is much more complicated than it first seems. Does this have either Jean-Claude Van Damme or, um, what's his name? The guy with the ponytail. Um, I know who you're talking about. Yeah. The American Kung Fu guy yeah. with the ponytail? No. Neither of those guys? No. Okay, I don't know. I've completely one. spaced that guy's name. Yeah. It does have Dolph Lundgren in it. Oh, I was going to say Dolph. <laughs> 
It's called Hidden Assassin. Hidden Assassin. Because they send a Danish guy as a CIA agent yes. to Prague for a Cuban summit. You know, Dolph's like an academic, right? Yes. He's a very smart dude. Yes, but this is not a very no, smart movie. It's not a very smart movie. <laughs> I get a point. Yeah, three points. Point. Wow. Seagal. That's Seagal. his name. Yes. <laughs> Steven Seagal. Steven Seagal. It came to me. Okay, this is my fourth one. This is an oldie. This is a 1954 movie. Okay. But you love old movies, I so. I do. I do. I'm, okay. I'm disappointed in myself that I don't know any of these movies. Neville Phillips is in this. He plays the admirer in this episode. He's uh, been in six Midsummers. okay? Yep. This is the story of a genius who hypnotizes an artist model into becoming a great concert singer. And how she escapes his influence only by his death. Is Mesmer or Mesmerino or Mesmerio no. in the title? She was a slave to his will under the hypnotic spell of those eyes. Innocent Trilby left her young lover for evil Svengali. Svengali. It stars Hildegard Kniff. She was a big film star back then. She was. The posters for it are in black and white and say... With color better than the Wizard of Oz, but they're black and white posters. <laughs> I don't understand that. Okay. Four for four. Four Woo-hoo! for four. Wow. Yeah, baby. I totally unch, unch, screwed unch, up there. Unch, 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 unch. I'm doing my happy dance. Sorry, it has a little beat to it. Yep. That is <laughs> the black book. The black book. Be sure to pay attention for the drop of the Midsummer Maniacs holiday parody song. On the 15th it will be of epic. December. Epic. Uh, remember, merch? Yeah. We got some for, merch. For a great cause. Yep. Um, and there is a new item there. It is yes. called the Nine Ways to Die in Midsummer Poster. Yes. With and it comes more in various sizes for your art-loving self. More Sarah art. Yes. So. so we will see you in two weeks. We hope you all have a safe, healthy Happy holiday. Yeah, pay attention to the Facebook groups, Midsummer and Acorn and Reddit and Twitter. We're gonna we're not going away. No. But but we're just not gonna post episodes for two weeks. We we need a break and we're gonna take a break and we will return on the fourth of January two thousand. We will see you in the new year. We'll see you in the new year yes. with a new episode on season twelve, episode three, which is Secrets and Spies on the fourth. Are you of- sure it's not Secrets and Lies? No, it's Secrets and Spies. Oh, it's January fourth, two thousand. Maybe Steven Seagal is in it playing Maybe. a spy. Maybe Patricia will be back with her ninja witch it's self. Got lots of guest stars and cricket in it. Yeah, cricket. Always exciting. And it has, remember, the cold <laughs> opening is in East Germany. Oh, yes. Dun, 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 dun. All right. So until then, bye, maniacs. Bye, maniacs. Season 12, episode three, spies and the other (laughs) word that it's supposed to be. I don't know the name of it. Uh, Spies and lies. The spy guys. (laughs) Dolph Lundgren.